Hello everyone and welcome to the Desolation Sounds podcast. My name is Stephen Hook and this is a podcast celebrating everything to do within the world of alternative music without rock, punk, metal or even extreme metal. Before we go through everything that's coming up on this week's show, just a quick reminder that every month, every time I review something, um, both for the show and just, you know, electronic music that I listen to in my spare time, I put it all into a playlist and at the end of the month I've released that playlist onto the world via Spotify and if you go onto any social media that I'm on, you'll find the greatest hits of July featuring the likes of Royal Republic, Nervous, Fresh, Denzel Curry, Hawkeyes, Jamie Lenman and at least some more. I genuinely believe there is something there for everyone. So do, 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 go check it out. But as for this week's show, news-wise, <clears throat> excuse me, because I took that little week off in the middle, I had um, friendos around, it would have been both awkward and difficult to record podcasts, considering all my recording gear is in the front room. Um, very little in terms of news I'm going to cover, except obviously that big tall thing that's happening. Um, but there's also some new albums being announced, so you've got stuff from Blink-182, Wednesday 13, Dragon Force, and of course, Tool again, they are... Everywhere at the moment, they are like the plague. Aaron reviews then come from Aaron West. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm already dying. Aaron West and the War... Oh, fuck me, I knew, I knew, I knew I was going to struggle with the W's and R's today. Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. God fucking damn. Um, and their second album, Routine Maintenance. You got The Strange as well, The Chosen One. And Vonis with Bikini Season and Open Mic. Go so fucking culty and so fucking aggro. It is Anal Nathrak in the constellation of the Black Widow. Oof, to get ready for that. I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, first the news. The biggest news, pretty much the only news I'm going to cover this week, apart from new releases, or new announcements, I should say, is Tool is now available on uh, Spotify, so streaming platforms. And I, I've seen a mixed reaction to this. You've got people who are genuinely excited to have Tool easily accessible i'm quite excited by it because i've never ever gone in on any kind of tool record i've my first experience in the tool multiverse i guess you could say was the perfect circle album last year and i really really enjoyed that and so like i've put all the tool albums in my catch-up list so i'd say expect them on an open mic section at some point in the future but one of the reactions I've seen, and I imagine it was more meant as a joke, but one of the podcasts I listened to was saying that part of the experience with Tool is that, like, before they were announced for Spotify, you had to go off and buy the CD or buy the record, sit down and listen to it via CD player over your vinyl player. And they're not sure they can get the same experience as listening to Tool on your headphones, walking about, or on your phone, whatever. And that irks me because the whole point of... You, you need to make music accessible for everyone. That's one of the joys of music. It's a medium that can be so easily transferred and so easily experienced by so many people. Like It's not like a film where you have to sit in one place and listen to it. It's not like a game where you've literally got to put your time, money and effort into it. Music you can listen to like as you're walking around, as you're doing stuff around the house. You... you like, I get where they're coming from in terms of Tool. Tool is one of those bands that reminds me of any, like, post-rock or post-metal band or a lot of prog stuff. You have to sit there and take it all in, which, you know, certain albums, that's fine. But you need to make it accessible in the first place. The only reason I'm ever intrigued by Tool is, A, everyone keeps babbling on about them, and B, I listened, I somehow found the song H from Anima years and years ago and i listened to that song a lot just that one song over and over and over again and that's what's made me quite intrigued to listen to tool on a big on a grander scale and you're not gonna have that if you don't have it on streaming servers and they say oh here's this week's new releases or here this week in rock and you've got like one or two random tool songs people can listen to it I was like man this is pretty different like, let's have a look. Wow, it's all pretty different. Let's listen to an album. Holy shit, everything makes sense now. You know, I just... Like I said, I imagine it was only meant as like an off-comment off joke. But 
giving people the opportunity to listen to talk in any situation surely must be better than them not listening to talk. If you want people to have better taste in music and have more alternative stuff graced by the mainstream, you need to start somewhere. 80% of the bands you listen to, would you would have picked up just from listening to a random song, like with your friends playing it, or they say, oh, check this out, and they've played you one song, or you listen to it out and about, or it's come on the TV. You get into bands through the odd one or two songs, and then you dive in deeper. You know? I'm... S <sighs> the music person in me is very excited about listening to Tool, because I even just like quickly skim through 20 seconds a piece for a couple of random Tool songs. And it does sound intense. It doesn't sound like something I can like walk about and listen to, but the fact I've got it now, I can like sit down as I'm doing something, I can have it playing, or I can just sit down as I'm just like chilling and have it playing. That side of me is very int intrigued. The cynical side of me is very, very annoyed because now, whereas before Tool fans were annoyed because Tool are the greatest band in the world. Excuse me, they're taking so long to release this album. Yada, yada, yada. I even wrote an, excuse me, I'm still dying. I even wrote an article basically saying all the fan bases that have waited longer for an album than Tool fans. So shut the fuck up. Now they are even more annoying because they're split between having tool accessible for everyone and that could be the hipster cool thing anymore. And my side of thing, which is making sure it's music is open for everyone. I'm still waiting for the new tool album to come out, which will be details in a bit. And then afterwards it's gonna be just memes and memes and memes of people say, Oh, I've waited a whole three days for a new tool album. Oh, it's gonna be another eight years and blah 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 blah. Suck my dick. And I just, I hate people. They're the worst. They are the worst. But the short version of all that is Tool is now available on Spotify. If you are a fan or if you're just a fan of interesting things, regardless of it's music, though if you're not into music, why are you here? If you're into interesting things and things that are slightly different and things that you have, you can probably think about do go check out Tool. I can't say from a personal point of view, but for everything I've heard and from the little tidbit I've heard, it is an experience to listen to Tool. So that's the bulk of the news I'm going to cover in terms of like actual main headlines. Some of the albums announced in my two-week departure, I'm only going to cover four that speak to me more than anything else. Uh, first, we're going to look at Blink-182. They've got a new album out called Nine. It's coming out the 20th of September. And so far, they've all released four singles from it. You've got Blame It On My Youth, Generational Divide, Happy Days, and Dark Side. Um, based on those four songs alone, Nine kind of sounds like if the entitled album was less depressed. You know, they experimented a lot with more like electronic things and like different effects. And doing that now, but whereas there was like quite gothic -y and emo, this is more upbeat, electro pop, sunny days, woo, aren't we having a great time? Um, it's called Nine, even though technically it is the eighth album. Uh, on our Reddit post, Mark Hoppus is counting Buddha in the lineage. It's also Nine is the number of love and other dumb shit. The songs themselves, so I'll go through them one at a time. Blame It On My Youth is very... The, all four of these tracks, well sorry, three out of the four of these tracks are very much the wrong side of pop punk. So instead of being punk with a pop um, sensibility and a pop appeal, it's pop music with a little bit of edge. Like um, All American Rejects or All Time Low or that kind of ilk. Fucking, what was he? I can't remember the chord. They had a uh, fucking female lead singer. It wasn't Paramore, although Paramore... Nah, I'd say Paramore had more edge than this. Either way, I can hear that song in my head. I can't think it was by... Uh, Tonight Alive! There we go. I'm proud of me. Um, yes, that kind of thing where it's very much pop music just played on guitar and drums. Blame My Youth has a catchy chorus, but otherwise, I wasn't a fan. Generational Divide is where they try being quite punk rock. And if I'm honest, it's the song out of the four that I like the least. 
it's very it it seems like the same line played over and over again are we better are we better now and just i find it quite boring and for a song that's 40 seconds long to be quite boring is effort happy day is a little bit better than blame on my youth um i've just got nothing to add that the whole all four songs don't really pop on me anymore um, I quite, I haven't said that, I do quite like Dark Side. I will take, rescind my comment. I quite like Dark Side. Um, it is everything they're trying to, what well, they look like they're trying to accomplish on the new album, which is very like electro, very poppy, pop punk, with a bit more bite to it. And I think a large part of that is down to the chorus with Matt Skiba. Um I'm not, I was thinking about this earlier, actually. I feel like I'm trying to like Blink-182 now. Like, their neighbourhoods... I was quite young. I was fairly young when it came out. And I thought it was very... Like, at the time, I thought it was great. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to play this in the summer. And then I think I still only listen to um, Hearts All Gone now. Because I think the rest of the album is pretty poor. Um, I very liked California when it came out. But I found myself not going back to it all that much at all. This when it came, when Blame on My Youth came out, I was like, "This is just too much. I can't deal with this." Found Generation Divide and didn't like that. Happy Days, I was like, "I just really want to do it." Um, I think I even put it on that uh, greatest hits from last for last month. Definitely put Dark Side on there. Like I said, I do quite enjoy Dark Side. I think that is the stronger of um, the four. But yeah, I'm just. I'm not keen on it anymore. I want to be. I so want to be. Blink-182, one of the bands that I grew up with, they were everywhere. They were, like, that core group of songs and bands that just got played everywhere when you're growing up, like Sweet Child of Mine, Enter Sandman, um, a lot of Sun 41's back catalogue, a lot of Green Day stuff. Got Just got played everywhere. And you don't want to see those bands go to shit like a lot of them have. Um, even my precious Green Day, I think, uh, aren't doing well. Revolution Radio, I enjoyed, but I, I can see its faults. Uno dos tres. Let's not. I will still hold a candle to Metallica and Guns N' Roses, though. They are omnipotent in my eyes. Um, but yeah, new Blink-182 album. It's called Nine, even though it's album number eight, technically. And it's coming out the 20th of next month. Moving on to still punk, but very, very different still. Wednesday 13 has a new album coming out called Necrophase. That's coming out the 27th of September. Lead single out is called Decompose. It is spooky, scary, spooky horror punk. Um, it's even got some little synth stuff in there as well. I really enjoyed that song, actually. It was it did make the greatest hits. Um, it's just insanely catchy. It makes me wish Murder Dolls was still around. Um, for those unaware, aware, Murder Dolls was the project Wednesday did with Joey Jordison, then of Slipknot. And it was the horror punk side of Wednesday 13 blended with the heavy metal background of Joey Jordison. And I thought it worked so well. I really, really enjoyed that project. Um, I'm looking forward to this. I think this will be my first Wednesday 13 album that I will properly pick up. The guests already confirmed on the album are... Roy Mayorga from Stone Sour and Hell Yeah, Alice Cooper, Alexi Leho from Children of Bottom, and Christina Scarbia from Lacuna Coil. So, kind of an all star cast in with all the spookiness. So, definitely looking forward to that. Wednesday 13, the album's called Necrophase, and that's coming out the 27th of September. One of the more recent ones that I've seen Dragon Force, Mighty Dragon Force, are coming back, and their album is called Extreme Power Metal. Oh, I love it. Uh, it's coming out again, 27th of next month. They've got a lead single out called Highway to Oblivion. It is everything you would expect it to be. Huge searing vocal parts. Um, is it Mark Hudson or Matt Hudson? I'm going to have to I wanna clarify this because I, it's power metal. I've talked about power metal a lot before. I enjoy power metal a lot. Um... The, it is Mark Hudson. Um, he does a great job on this. I think 
the band's a collective are finally realizing just how cheesy their kind of music is because the music video for highway to oblivion is very tron very 80s lots of color um they play nothing but high register all the time it's a song about a car you know they've gone full cheese with it and i am all about it um musically like herman and sam sound great um julian guitarist again it's going to be the first album without is it vadim yeah i believe so first album without um oh, i'm gonna try and pronounce his name aren't i vadim prusinov i think i did it right for that uh, first album that um, vadim prusinov he has been, I think it said, replaced on the album by the fellow from Epico, Cohen Janssen. So, pretty good credibility in terms of keyboard, but I am looking forward to it. I've just seen the album cover. Holy fucking shit, that looks ridiculous. I'm all about it. It's coming out 27th next month, and it's got a Celine Dion cover as well. Fucking hell, it's going to be a great time. Um, and last album I will talk about is that band Tool again. They finally confirmed all the details for their new album, Fear Inoculum. It is coming out the 30th of this month. Holy fucking shit. Um, when I wrote it down, they hadn't confirmed anything else in the time since they have released the album art for the album. It looks spacey and weird as you expect. And according to... Why can't I remember his name? Why can't I not remember the guy from Tool's name? It's Tool. He's like... Fucking... Fuck. Man of James Keenan. I... I, I, I lo it loaded before. I, I remembered it before it loaded, I should say. Shut up. Um, yeah, Man of James Keenan has come out and said that it's going to be... About an hour and a half long. I think I read somewhere about 83, 87 minutes. Um, and it's only going to be seven tracks long. Something bizarre like that. Like, that's going to be like 10 minutes a song. I don't know if I've ever told you guys, but I like punk rock. I like short, crisp, to the point kind of songs. I feel like I might struggle with this one. Um, and I feel like for a few weeks, it's not going to be three albums and then an open mic. It's going to be two albums and an open mic and me just constantly having to go over the tall album to realize what the fuck is going on. Um, but yeah, Fear in Auckland, it is finally confirmed that it'll be coming out the 30th of August after all this fighting with the band, his side projects, legalities, Justin Bieber, apparently um yeah it's all it's all going to happen and tall fans are somehow going to get even more annoying um but that's all the new albums you've got stuff coming out from blink Night 2 wednesday 13 dragon force and tall the friday after this goes out we will also have slipknot which won't be on next week's show it will most likely be on the week after this show because of the way i listen to my music um anyways on to the big stuff and, <clears throat> excuse me, we shall start with Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. I have to concentrate so hard to say that. It is, uh, well, the album is called Routine Maintenance. It is the second album from literally, well, like, IRL from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, the story in the album, um, Aaron West, is from New York City, I believe. Or you can just say New York. Um, Aaron West and the Roaring Womp 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 is the folk rock side project of Soupy, Dan Campbell, from The One That He Is. And unlike many other folk projects from pop punk guys, of which I, there I can't name at the moment, I read somewhere or like looked somewhere, someone, a podcast told me about all the different ones that exist, and I was like, oh fuck, yeah, that's a, that's a common thing. Man with lovely voice, plays on guitar, who'd have thought it? And he's white. Um, this disassociates itself from any of that bollocks um, because it goes, it's not just some bloke with a lovely voice playing on the guitar looking really sad and shit. It's the full folk armada. 
You've got brass in there, you've got banjos, you've got ukes, you've got um, violins. Fucking Frank trying to eat your heart out. Because musically, this is fucking great. Um, and he does, he goes all different breadths of the sad end of folks. So you've got some upbeat songs, you've got some very slow and somber songs, which we'll I'll probably cover in a bit. Um, and I say like it's the low end of folk because the collection of songs on this album is by far some of the saddest set of lyrics I have ever heard in my entire life. Fuck yeah. Um, I almost cried a lot. It's been a tough week anyways, but I almost cried a lot listening to this. Um, the long running narrative in the project is Aaron West has gone through so far since the previous album, which was called... We, we don't have each other. I thought of that all by myself. I'm not using the internet. Um, yeah, the long running narrative is that West has gone through a suicide attempt, the death of his father, um, the death of his unborn child, his wife has left him, and now he's battling homelessness. Um, someone please give Supi a cuddle, because if this is all going on in his head, I think he needs it. I know. Oh, it's just a story. You know, it doesn't say anything about the author. It's like being GCSE English, where why would the author say the sky was blue? Is it because he's sad? Is it because he's horny? No, the sky's blue. Someone give Supi a cuddle, because if this is what's going on in his head, I think he needs it. Um, It is just... And because it is Supi, because he is that fella from the one that he is, you feel every vocal note he pushes on you. He's got such an emotive voice. I remember years ago on um, Reddit, someone said, or someone asked a question on some kind of subreddit, can you name any songs or any artists that sound like they're on the brink of tears um, in the music, which I thought very fucking friendly. I also thought, you want to get one of the years because I think it's Palm Reader on um, No Closer to Heaven. Constantly sounds like he's about to fucking ball out and I'm just... Oh man, it's great music, but it's so fucking difficult to listen to. Excuse me. Um, in Just Sign the Papers, you've got West pleading to his soon-to-be ex-wife, Diane, to get the divorce over and done with as soon as possible. Not for his sake, but for hers. Uh, he even goes on to say, I'm sorry for every single thing I put you through. Including like all his dramatic emotions and... Like still pushing on with his with his music career, um, the like him her having to be the burden. Well, not a burden, I guess, but just his outlet when he's being upset with the death of his father. It's it's a difficult listen for that alone because he's blaming himself and he's trying to like relieve the pressure, which up for debate whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing it's not for me to judge not had mental health issues before but you know that's what it is it's incredibly emotional to listen to um in gods and the billboards he picks up the phone to his sister uh i believe a bit of a strange relationship between him and his sister i remember in an earlier song he got a bar fight and refused to call her because she's got a good life now he doesn't want to interrupt again that's a lot of like self-imposed exiles kind of stuff um, but in God on the Billboards, he has a conversation with his sister that her husband has just died and that, of course, he's going to come home and see her. And then that narrative continues into Winter Coats. Um, sorry, no, the, the, the narrative continues from Winter Coats into the title track at the end where West is now supporting his nephew. He is supporting his sister as a result of that and his mother. And he's sort of having a conversation with his father that shows that he can be accountable. Um, and it is... It's quite interesting. I think I said this with the... I said this a couple of weeks ago with the Fresh album. That, oh, it's really interesting to see an email album have a continued narrative. And now i found a fucking second one. Um, it's a very cynical happy ending because he's gone through all this and now his family's going through all this and now... He's finally realised it's his time to prove that he can build himself back up and he can be the supportive figure in his family's life. Like, I think it is in routine maintenance when he's having this conversation with his dad. 
saying about how all those times he was with his dad in the garage um, fixing up cars, he never thought he took anything in. And now here he is teaching the nephew how to fix up the family's car. And like he adds things like, I was never really paying attention, but apparently something went in. It is so emotionally devastating what Soupy does in this. And it became... It, I didn't want to stop. I wanted to keep listening and keep finding out what happens next. and Because um, I was just listening to it. I was listening to it and listening to it. And I thought, this is great. It's a sad, but whatever. Then I read up the lyrics. And then I was listening to it again. And I'm like, I, it's like a really sad audiobook with music. And it's just playing over and over. And it's just, you can hear the pain in his voice. Because again, Soupy is a very emotive vocalist. The narrative is going along it. It's very heart-wrenching as well and then his battle to kind of i guess overcome it or try and be better than it is powerful in its own right and along the way soupy does have this like witchcraft like way of making it all so fucking catchy um running towards the light has this beautiful chorus to it um and on any other album and any other lyrics, the musical cheer and the musical mood to Bury Me Anywhere Else and Rosa and Rosita, that would inspire you to just do anything. Like, you'd pop off the sofa and like, I can literally accomplish anything I want to do in life. You pay too much attention to the lyrics and you're just going to stay right sat on the sofa and cry. But move past that, just you listen to the music, it'll be fine. You know, find the karaoke version. It is, it is a difficult album, this. And not because it's musically challenging. It's not like... I was going to try and think about it. It's not like literally any other album I'm going to review this week. Or any of the albums I'm probably going to review next week. It is challenging because it is just so emotionally raw. Um, it is just... it's a, It is a story. Like If it was like his own personal trials, you'd just be sat back and like, fuck... Oh, man. Because it's a story, it's a little bit easier, but then as a part of me, it's like, but, but what if it's based on true life? What if he knows someone who went off through this? What if it's just, what if this is him? Just like a ghost writing his own biography. Oh, man, listen to this. It's, don't listen to this on a bad day. Don't do that. I did that one time this week. Terrible idea. Listen to it when you're a little bit perky, so then you can go into a dark mood and then get better again when the tar track comes around um give it a listen if you are a fan of crying or if you're a fan of sitting color the band uh or the man the mountain goats and bright eyes i don't know too much about mountain goats and bright eyes they were um like the bands i found to compare so if you f somehow found mountain goats and bright eyes we haven't found aaron west um uh, if you're a fan of sitting color who i'm aware of kind of idyllic folk rock but has actually got some more traditional folk elements into in it like violins fiddles uh, banjos etc give this a go it is i it's honestly i, I expect to listen to it I think man this is great and then continue off again i still hum bits of it just out and about and i think i've put it quite high in like i, I keep a list of everything i listen to across the year and it is I think it, I did put up burgeoning on the top 20 spaces. I it, I honestly do think it's up there. It'd be interesting. Is it going to be, is there going to be a sad folk album in, in the end of year list? It could be, you never know. I mean, you will know when we get to like December time, but it's not. Sep Wait, did I say September or December? I meant December if I didn't. Shut up. Um, That was, fuck, I've already lost where I am. Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. I got it right first time. Didn't really have to think about it. Um, the album's called Routine Maintenance. Um, it's the side project from Soupy from the One Years. That emo band that makes things sound really, really sad, but really, really great. Um, and yeah, like I said, I really, really, really enjoyed this album. It's emotionally punishing, but it's worth it. It's absolutely worth it. Moving on then to pretty much the opposite end of the field. This album is called The Chosen One. It is by an Italian band called Destrage. 
or Destrage. I can't remember what I've always called them because I've thought about it too much now. I think I've called them Destrage. They play a progressive style of metalcore and their 2014 album, Are You Kidding Me? No, was one of the best and most interesting albums of that year. Um, it is a, oh, sorry, it was a frenetic, maddening barrage of mathcore fronted by a new generation Mike Patton is the level of comparison I'm giving him. You're welcome. Uh, the follow-up, A Means to No End, that came out a couple of years later, wasn't quite as immediate. Um, that's not to say it wasn't good. It was still very, very good, but it didn't hit me quite as quickly or quite as abrupt as Are You Kidding Me? No did. I think maybe a part of that is because I knew kind of what to expect now. Um, and a part of that is since Are You Kidding Me? No, because that, that was, what, album three? The two albums beforehand were very, much more mathy and much more, like, thrash metalcore they sort of like peaked in like lunacy with that and they are slowly bringing back down in a means to no end and now subsequently the chosen one uh straight away the melodies in the choruses on this album are another level they are just so i've described them as just being so alive and i've also blamed paolo colavolpe on that and Paolo is the lead singer of Distrage. He is such a dexterous vocalist and he has more of a command over his voice than ever before. This is kind of why I was describing it. Well, I must admit, I stole the Mike Patton comparison from Right Act, but it just made so much sense to me. The way Mike Patton can control his voice and be this blood curdling screamer to this very angelic, like choir boy, very reminiscent in Paolo. I think he does vocally such a fantastic job across it all. He's gotten a lot better. Like I always thought like Are You Kidding Me No was just phenomenal vocally. But he's got just gotten better and better and better between Are You Kidding Me and then the Means No End and then the Chosen One. Um as I was saying before, Destrage's sound has reverted down from like a more it was initially like in the first couple of albums it was more thrashy metalcore, then it became almost full on mathcore, and it's now down to like a more refined progressive metalcore kind of thing if you are like big follower genres like me um hey stranger we'll use as the example there is always something happening in the song whether it's a drum roll or it's an offbeat or it's like a splitting lick or even a gigantic mighty saxophone because we have sax on this album but yeah we do um it's still chaotic it's still a mad assortment of sounds but it is, it feels like it's more, it's delivered in a more structured way now. If that makes sense, it is more refined, more together. And it's not quite as all over the place. It's difficult. It's more, I don't want to say it's more song-like because I think that does this kind of music to service. But I think the more metalcore side of things are peering through a bit more. If any, any of that makes sense. Um... And while this is a new, bit more reserved Destrage, there is still, there's still moments on this album. It's still very, very good. Um, this is my one last rave about all the choruses because, again, they can make um, the choruses sound just mighty huge on the album. Um, Rage, my alibi, has a quite an eerie 90s corn stroke Marilyn, Ma Marilyn Manson vibe to it all. About that, I'd honestly say it's probably their best song since My Green Neighbor. And My Green Neighbor was the song that got me into them in the first place. Um, I think the album does miss the madness a little bit. The experiments are still there. You know, you got um, At the Cost of Pleasure is a bit more of like a stomping groove metal kind of thing. The Gifted One blends in some like post-rock and I saw some most described as psychedelic. Um, but it just doesn't quite click and doesn't quite resonate with me quite in the same way as are you kidding me no um as i keep saying i do think this is still a good album i think of the three albums i keep talking about so this it means no end and are you kidding me no i think it is their weakest um but i do think it is a good starting block if you are uh, never heard of this trade you want to get into him and if you work backwards it gets a bit more chaos a bit more rambunctious and then 
with Are You Kidding Me? No, is just the peak of um, progressive and frenetic metalcore. Um, yeah, fantastic start point, I feel. On the other side of all that, if they do want to go down this route of big choruses with like progressive metalcore, I honestly think they can handle that. Like, I'll rack on about Paolo again. He is an incredible vocalist, and I reckon he can get that new stadium chorus prog metalcore out there. Early signs in there, I think, if they, like... <sighs> See, this is where, like, a, a non-musician, I don't know what they can do, but refine the songwriting so that it does really explode on the choruses and still keeps things interesting and progressive in the verses, I think. That'll be very interesting for the next album. Is what I'm trying to say, I think. Just very interesting to find out if they can go full hog on this new, like, explosive chorus. Start the metal call. Who knows? I wish I could do, I wish I could do more to say, like, they should do this, but I feel like everything I can say, they're already doing. The most best exercise is, if you just do it better. Which is fucking useless advice. And don't listen to me to Strange, I know nothing. Um, if you've never checked out the Strange before... Like I said, this is a good starting block. Go for them if you are a fan of Sixth, if you're a fan of Process to Hero, or if you're a fan of Between the Baron and Me. The album is called The Chosen One. It is album number five from the Milan-based Destrage. Or oh, Destrage. Something in Italian. I don't know. All I know is I quite like them as a band. And I almost missed it. I didn't even realise they, like, they released a new album. Shows you what I know, A. Eh? Cool. We will look at... I just peeled something. What was this? Um, we'll look at the last album of like the new shit for this week. It is called Bikini Season. It is not as fun as that name suggests. And the band is called Vonis, and they are from Ghent in Belgium. This is their debut album, and I've kind of like pigeonholed them as power violence, but it is power violence mixed with black metal, death metal, general hardcore, grindcore. I saw someone compare it to hard rock as well, but I don't hear it. There is too much going on to throw hard rock in there. It's, it, well, no, mm -mm. nah, no chance. Um, I'm just staring at the album artwork now, and that is a man's head up another man's bottom. Mm, and it's just a halo multiple halos of of heads and bums right okay um the album opens with this smoky doomy drone mess that slowly erupts into a hybrid of black metal and the more crusty side of punk and it sticks with this very raw sound throughout the entire album the um, the production makes it sound like the master tapes were caught in some kind of fire and they're just being mangled and mottled, but they sent them off the press anyways. Um, Noise Down reminds me of like a really dark um, Dead Kennedys kind of song. Um, Doc Song barks at you like an old timely acrophobic nosebleed kind of thing. It is just... It is a... Like... I described Aaron West as a difficult album because not because musically, but because of lyrically and like emotionally. This was a difficult album musically. Excuse me. It's and I don't know why. Excuse me. I'm still dying. I don't know why I struggled with this more than I struggled with, say, Converge or anything like that. Um, one thing I did genuinely like, I was surprised that I found myself a listening and be enjoying um a collaboration with a rapper called opw on a song called love letters never sent you know rap and metal crossed over a lot over the years i never thought i'd see it in like blackened power violence hardcore stuff you know um but it is a fucking cracker of a song um ojos brillantes is a song that a lot of people are jumping on and it is a deafening blast of punk influenced black metal um i must admit that song is really fun 
it is very abrasive and it's very disorienting type of music is bikini season it's very explosive it's very at your all time it is a witch's cauldron full of extreme metal styles to the point where sometimes it does border um, border on noise you know it is just as i was saying it's difficult because i don't musically difficult not emotionally difficult and i can't put like i said i can't put my finger on why it's harsher than say converge i think a large part of that is the um production where it is it's got like noise haze over everything um hasn't massively clicked with me because polished sound i like it when it's a bit more produced and yeah, 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 yeah. um Noise down, love levels never sent, and Ojos Brillante stick out more to me because they broke away from the like scorched earth brand of hardcore, um, and like that scorched earth brand of hardcore is great, but it does feel like it just sort of like blends together, and like that is why those three songs stuck out because you've got Noise Down, which. It's sort of it's sort of a bit more hero worship for Dead Kennedys. Love Let's Never Send is got that rap element in it. Ojos Brillantes, I think it's just a good song, and that's why it stuck out with me even more. But the rest of the album for me, that again, that noise haze, that just like oncoming or incoming just blast of aggression, just glazes over me a little bit. Um, and from the looks of it, I am the outlier. Like fans of black and hardcore have gone fucking dippy over this, and I think they are right to go dippy over this. Um, other reviews I saw were giving it eight out of tens and nine out of ten. So don't let my crude opinion of this like dictate. Of course, you should always listen to albums for yourself. It's the style of music you want to listen to, and I don't like it. Still listen to it yourself. You might be able to call me a dickhead. Who knows? Um, if you are a fan of Young and In a Way, Joy, or I remember like. If you remember the band Plagues I reviewed a few months ago, I think if you did enjoy that, you should go for Vonis. And I really enjoyed Plagues, and, you know, it's awkward now, but I honestly think if you liked Plagues, give this a go, because I think there's a lot of in there for you. It's, it goes harder than Plagues. Like I said, that noise and that blackened thing over top of it is more aggro, but, you know, I think, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so yeah, Plagues, Joy, Young and In The Way, go for any of them, go for Vonis and their debut album, Bikini Season. Um, Belgium, very quickly becoming a good source of new and exciting and fucking terrifying music. So if nothing else, support the Belgians. And those are the three albums of the week. We are now moving on to the open mic, which is Anal Nathrak. With their 2009 album in the constellation of the Black Widow. It was album number five for the Birmingham based duo of Vitriol, or Dave Hunt to his mates, and Mick Kenny. If you are completely unaware of Anarnathrak, they are industrial, I think at the core, the easiest way to describe them are industrial black metal, but they blend death metal, grind core, um, there was a couple of songs on their latest album which I thought had a bit of a deathcore kind of thing to it as well they are just you thought Vonis was a hodgepodge of extreme metal genres bands like that ex- aspire to be a Narnathrak it is just it is staggering how good and how popular they are like live shows have been pretty scarce I don't think they played a live show I think they did a one-off in 2005, one in 2007, and then from 2007 they started getting booked. Which you think, man, that's like over 10 years of them playing records. What's the big deal? They formed in 1999. That's nearly 10 years of building up a... Um, oh, sorry, I'm nervous. An image and reputation, that's the word. That's nearly 10 years of building up a reputation just on studio work alone you know from people who they've had like they had projects beforehand but never like my comparison would be king of hell and the two guys on that king of hell as far as i never played live they were just a studio project between i think it was shagrath and of hell from like 
various black metal bands. Um, and yeah, because they because they came from two very prominent black metal bands, obviously everyone knew what this new band was. Hunt and Kenny like were just in underground black, um, black metal bands, but yet they somehow because of how good they write music together, they just and now they are the violently hot shit that they are. Um, so yeah, live shows were scarce. They they. I think they've only formally released lyrics to one song in their entire back catalogue. And I think they're on album nine now. Um, Forward from A New Kind of Horror, which came out last year, was the first time they've formally released lyrics to a song. They're so cryptic and so um, sneaky with their music and their, like, their behind the scenes kind of thing for their music. And the music is just so abusive. It's so just onslaught. I don't know. to Just to turn that into an adjective, it's so onslaught, I'm sure, of all different styles and variations that's happening. But there is this crude... Um, oh, what's, that's not crude. That's the one thing I think of. Uh, I can't think of the word. But it, it's just... This fascination for every song of another track that I listen to. And I just can't stop wanting to listen to more. With each new album that I listen to, I think they, they can never top. They can never get more aggro, more intense than this. And then I listen to a al- new album. And I'm like, well, fuck. But now they can do it. And then I listen to an album. I'm like, well, fuck. Well, now they can, and, you know, just rinse and repeat. Rinse and repeat. Um, I think a big part of what draws me in is in the songwriting. Uh, Kenny will conjure up the most sickening barrage of noise. Um, Because it is, again, Dave Hunt does all the vocal stuff. Mick Kenny does anything to do with music. He even produces the album as well. Um, So he's just like a mad scientist of music and um, effects and noise and this, that, and the other to conjure up the spine of an anthrax. And so you've got all that, and it's combined with Hunt, who will scream and growl and just shriek into the mic over the top of it, which is, you know, screaming and shouting over black metal and over like extreme metal in general, pretty powerful, of course. But it's when Hunt explodes with these, like, I can't tell if there's people ye- yelling and punching each other outside my house. Might just be conversation, who knows, we had someone shout outside our house the other day and smash stuff. Um, it's when Hunt really goes all in on, like, the big vo- clean vocal lines, that's what hits you the most. And it's not like a melodic break or any kind of ballad or that sort of dumb shit, it's just the sheer strength of his um, voice powering through. Um, it reminds me of like what I want from melodic death metal bands. When you have like that melodic part that's got like a clean vocal or like a subdued harsh tone, just because you've like turned like turned down a bit or been a bit slow, that doesn't mean it's melodic or bad or you know gone soft or anything like that. Melodic doesn't have to mean sh- like ballady, you know. In the more latter day kind of Nathrak stuff, uh, Dave Hunt has started to do like a King Diamond style falsetto in amongst As He Screams, which when you listen to a song about World War One or the apocalypse or anything like that, and you've just got this falsetto scream like quite high in the mix, it is fucking terrifying. And you want to go home and you want to cry. And then you remember you're wearing headphones and you can take them off, but you just don't want to. You just don't want to because you want to take everything in. For Constellation of Black Widow then, once you press play on the album, it is just, it's just devastating. It absolutely is. I know it's cliche to say, but it fucking just pummels you to death. The vocals to I Am The Wrath Of God... I knew I was going to fuck that up. I Am The Wrath Of The Gods. Nope. I Am The Wrath Of Gods And The Desolation Of The Earth. When I'm not fucking that up, 
the actual vocals to it literally sound like someone being the victim of the wrath of the gods witnessing the desolation of the earth. And that is not me trying to be clever. That is just me sound telling you. It sounds like a fucking murder is happening. It is horrifying. It's just... It almost goes... It surpasses music sometimes because it's just him screaming in terror down the, vocal, down the microphone. It's horrible sometimes, but you just want to keep listening. And it's a similar kind of deal in the Lucifer effect, which is a bit more of a death metal kind of thing. And just the, the breakdowns and the chug on that uh, on that song. Slams harder than like 95% of all the metalcore and deathcore bands out there at the moment, or just of all time. Uh, musically, I think deep down, Mick Kenny is a like secret trad metal or power metal kind of fan. The that's a big whammy dive into like a midi shredathon in more of fire than blood. There's the bends in the chorus of the unbearable filth of the soul. The solo, just the solo on um, terror in the mind of God, all just scream denim cutoffs, long like windmill and hair, um, and throwing the horns out as an official greeting to your pals. You know. There's a lot of, I don't want to say maiden worship because I feel like it's too easy, but just the whole deal of it all feels very, again, 80s metal or power metal or that kind of thing. Otherwise, the drums go faster and harder than a marching band on cocaine. On more of fire than blood, again, just the sheer despair backing Hunt's vocals is just magical. It makes everything sound so hostile, but yet so great. Um, a gentleman called Zeitgeist Memento, I did not write down his real name, uh, from the band. I'm going to say it's Republica. There's a V where you should be. I know it's pretty cult-like, but, you know. Um, Zeitgeist Memento from Republica, guest on Oil Upon the Source of Lepers. And it really reminds me of like a Cra- of Craig, Greg Prashado um, style of execution. And now I really want Greg and... He, of course, formerly of Danger Escape fan, now of the Black Queen. Really want him to guest on a an Alan Strike album and just battle Dave Hunt in a game of screaming. I think that'll be a great time. Don't know about you. I think that'd be grand. Um, and the last song I'll sing a lot is the end song, um, Blood Eagles Carved in the Back of Innocence. Fuck, just some of the, the song names. That is almost uncomfortable to listen to. In fact, I think when I listened to it last night, admittedly at like one or two o'clock in the morning, I had to turn it off because it's just too, it's almost too much sometimes just because of Dave's just shrill, horrendously shrill screams. In Analithrak excel at being just a blinding barrage of power. They I covered them a little bit earlier, but they'd sit in a realm alongside the likes of Converge and Dillinger Escape Plan, um, whereby on paper they should not be the least bit palatable. They should just be noise music and be just be left to like a very small group of people who like noise. But the cathartic nature of the music and how they all bring it together and the hostility allows you to just release those inner aggressions. You know, not everything has to be sunshine and rainbows. And albums like this and bands like Nana Threat, Converge and Dinger Escape Plan, they hold your hand and they say, you know what? It's okay. Not everything does have to be sunshine and rainbows. And then they turn around and twat you on because just you just deserve it for reasons that aren't quite fully explained. And one last thing I'll say is, um, I particularly love on this album, and it spreads across the entire Analithrak discography, when, obviously, you, they're very, very, very closed off with releasing lyrics to their songs. Um, and because of Dave Hunt's vocal style, the lyrics are largely illegible anyways. But when you're listening to a song, and the lyrics are largely illegible, as I said, and you're just taking everything in, you're getting like br- battle and just like torn apart by this level of extreme music. You'll hear one line in the lyrics that you can make out and understand before the world just fucking explodes around you. Like the example I'll use, like one last time, uh, terror, in, terror in the Mind of God, you've got this rampaging Tremella riff. 
back and forth screams between, well, back and forth, sorry, between screams and growls. Heart stopping blast beats. And then you just hear the song name being sung in like this little break. And then when he goes to like terror in the mind of, and then as soon as he says God, the whole thing just drops and the song comes back in again. And you just, you're just stood there and like, oh, I want to body slam a fucking building. And it's a good feeling. Go on body slam buildings. It's, I had difficulty trying to compare, like, if you're a fan of this, give and anything, because I think they covered too much of a broad spectrum of extreme music. If you just like music intent to fucking hurt you, go and check out Analothrak. And from what I can see online, the core fan base between in Analothrak they are split between Hell is Empty and The Devil's All Here and In the Constellation of the Black Widow as their two best albums. I personally started with Desideratum from 2014. So, and from there I moved on to, well, I just sort of kept them with albums as they released them. So, The Whole of the Law and New Kind of Horror. Um, I think Desideratum is a good starting point if you want to get into this because I think it does have a little bit more melody in it. Um, new kind of horror I would say is a bit more melodic but I think it goes harder one of the songs is fucking retrofitted with machine gun fire as it's playing a riff so you know that's a thing um, but now extreme metal you cannot pretty much cannot go any better than an anathrak and in this example, you've got in the constellation of the Black Widow. It came out in two thousand nine. It is a fucking beast, and all the cool shit comes. All the cool shit musically comes from Birmingham, apparently. Again, all these years later. Cool. So that'll do it for this week's episode of the Desolation Sounds podcast. Of course, I've always been Stephen Hook. This week, you have listened to album reviews for. Aaron West and the Roaring Twenties. I'm finally getting that right. Destrage, Vonis, and Analnathrak. Next week, you have the pleasure of li- listening to me babble on about Viata's Murder, Northlane, and Borders. So it was a last minute switch up because oh, I've accidentally made myself a very core kind of day next week. So look forward to that. As I said at the top of the show, there is a greatest hits from all of July sitting on Spotify waiting for you to take it all in. Like I said, there's a little bit of everything in there for you. There's indie, there's emo, there's hip-hop, there's deathcore, there's grindcore. Everything's in there. Do go give it a listen and find something new and like impression mates because you're a super hips dude. Um, and then if it's all shit, let me know on social medias at Desolation Pod. Otherwise, I will see you all next week. Have a lovely, lovely time. The kids are almost back at school. Remember this. Bye.